Hey there, friends, villagers, trolls, haters, <laughs> maniacs. My name is Dave Politis, KM Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And this is Bigfoot 101 Class 3. Thanks for being here. This poster, our next documentary coming out December 12th, Missing 411, the UFO Connection. You can watch the trailer, get a feeling for it. It's going to be huge, folks. Huge. Now, it's a Bigfoot class. So, I want to tell you about a few things that you need to know about the Bigfoot world. There's a lot of psychos out there. I have been invited to speak at a Bigfoot conference in Kelso, Washington. And I have spoke there before. Crowds were huge. Standing ovations when I got done. Um, our booth was overwhelmed the entire time we were there. The people were extraordinarily nice and the Chamber of Comfort Conference, <coughs> Chamber of Commerce invited me back the following year, which was a few months ago. This has never happened before, folks. I got a death threat in the, on an email saying I better not come. <clears throat> Otherwise, I was going to suffer severe consequences. Turn it over to the Chamber of Commerce. Turn it over to the local sheriff. And essentially, I'm not afraid, but Angie travels with me when I go. And there is no way I'm going to subject her to any possible violence. We stay at a hotel. We go out to dinner. There's a lot of ways to get to, to us other than being at the conference itself. And the conference people said, yeah, we could guarantee your safety while you're there, you know, pretty much, but we can't when you're not there. And I made a decision not to go. It's the first time I've ever had that happen to me. And it's because I'm, I'm pointing out facts that are uncomfortable to the ape group, gorilla group that's out there. And they don't want to hear the facts. Just like in politics today, there's a cancel culture. Unless you speak what they want you to say, they're going to cancel you out. They're going to threaten you and they're, they're going to threaten violence against you, which is exactly what happened. Now, since then, I've gone to another conference in Washington, and I had armed protection with me, thank God. And I know Kelso wants to have me back again, and I'm going back next time. And I already know that there's a group of police officers that said, Dave, we'll, we'll be with you the whole time while you're there. I have a pretty good idea who, who threatened me. It's a person who's threatened me in the past. It's a group of people that have an extremely closed mind. But that's the way the Bigfoot world is. And one of the reasons I left it and just let them have their own feces, as it will, I stopped going go to their conferences. Early on, maybe 10 years ago, Harvey Pratt and I went to a conference in Hanobi, Oklahoma. And it was the same thing. We didn't want people showing up to the conference that spoke what you two were going to speak. Well, Harvey was armed. His wife, Gina, was armed. I felt in great company. They were part of the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation at the time. And what happened while we were there? They actually had somebody plant an explosive in the bathroom on the fairgrounds where we were at. That's how psychotic these people are. Yeah. So, that's not going to stop me from telling the truth. And if I embarrass some people, so be it. Nobody wants to debate this because there can be no debate. People have said, well, Dave, the DNA study's done. If somebody disagrees with it, why don't they do their own? Ha <laughs> ha! Ka-ching! Why don't they? 
Well, there's people in the academic circle that walk around in the Bigfoot world and they could get a grant and do their own DNA study. But they won't because they know it's going to come back the same. When we did our DNA study, we didn't understand why other people hadn't done it before. It's because it doesn't follow what their purporting Bigfoot Sasquatch to be. They're, they're alleging it's an animal. They're alleging that it's a, a Bigfoot is probably an ape or a gorilla or something along those lines. But it's not. It's a human. It's a human hybrid. And I say hybrid because we only know what half the DNA is. We don't know the other half. And when we filed that with GenBank, the biggest uh, bank in the world for genetics on DNA, they had never seen the other half. Not from this world. It's the only thing you could say. So, I'm going to start again. This is class three, so we can't get too far ahead of ourselves. In my journey, as I tried to learn the facts going down the line, so one of the things I was doing at that very early stage was collecting as many books as I could and reading them. The older the books, the better, because the older the book was, the less it was tainted by people's opinion today. So one of those books that I got was called the Nehalem Tillamook Tales. Now, some of the people would say, oh, you know what, not very good, not really worth it, blah, 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 whatever. So, anything having to do with Native American history, I'm interested as it relates to Bigfoot, etc. Wild man. So, on page 47 of the Nehalem Tillamook Tales, page 162, wild man. This happened in Nehalem. One man who had two wives would live up the Nehalem River. He was living there that winter. Other people moved back near the ocean after the fishing season, but this man and two wives were going to remain there all winter. There was snow on the ground. Once in a while, he would go fishing for steelhead. He would spear them so he'd have fresh fish. One night, he was sleeping with his wife, who was childless. The woman was with a baby, was sleeping on the other side of the fire of her baby. He woke in the night, and he heard the baby crying, and crying. He called to the wife, say, wake up, the baby's crying. There was not a sound from her. He arose and built up the fire, which was almost out. He put pitch wood in the fire and made it light. A large hole was torn in the house. One entire corner of the building was gone. He walked, he walked to his wife's bed, no wife. Just a little baby was there. He took his baby, he carried it over to the other woman. He said, something must have happened. He lit a pitchwood flare. He went outside to look for tracks near the torn out corner of the house. In the snow, he saw tracks made by feet that long, parentheses, about three feet. Then he knew that there was, this was not an ordinary person. He went back in the house. He said, you know, the other wife of mine must be dead. I fear she had been killed. There was a wicked being that wild man had come and taken her. I saw his tracks. I do not care if I get killed. If I do not return, you must put everything you want in that canoe and go down river. Go down to where there are many people. He was not afraid, perhaps, because he knew the wild man. Perhaps he had a power. He had his power. He repaired his flare. He spliced together long pitchwood pieces so that it would not burn out too quickly. He made two long flares and started with one of them burning. He took all of his arrows. He carried his bow. He started out. He would follow those tracks easily. After some time, he put out the light on his pitchwood. He could see the light ahead, a very bright light. Wild man had built a fire. The man arrived there. There he saw a wild man who had built a large fire and was sitting by it. He had cut huge huckleberry bush and it had impaled the woman on it. He was cooking her by the fire. The husband thought, I will watch him for a while and see what he does. After a while, the wild man turned that steak around as to cook the meal evenly. He glanced at front. The woman's breasts were cooked. The wild man reached over, pulled off one breast, and put it in his mouth. After he reached across, the husband shot the wild man under the arm. 
The wild man brushed off the arrow, saying, Ouch, sparks are falling on me. Here I am merely eating my fresh meat, and a spark had to light my body on fire. He brushed that arrow off. He arose. He walked around, reached for the other breast with the other hand. In the same manner, the man shot him under the other arm. Again, the wild man brushed that arrow off. Ouch, sparks flew around me. He ate the second breast. The husband continued shooting at him. Suddenly, a wild man stood up. He ran uphill a short distance and stopped. It did not sound as if he had kept on going. The story goes on. There are stories of Bigfoot wild man using fire hundreds of years ago. And those stories go towards the ability of others to find out where they lived. And it would appear as though that over time, wild man learned, according to natives, that if you use fire, you can be found. So they stopped using fire. Another book called Nine Years with the Spokane Indians, The Diary of Elkanaw Walker, 1838 to 1848. Page 122, under the diary, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. This book was written in the 1970s after an accumulation of the diary of Walker. In it, it says this, in Walker's letter to Green on April 16th, 1840, we find the following. They, the natives, believe in the existence of a race of giants which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west of us. The mountain is covered with perpetual snow. They inhabit its top. They hunt and do all their work at night. They are men stealers, M-E-N stealers. They come to people's lodges in the night when the people are asleep and take them and put them under their skins and take them up to their place of abode without them ever awakening. When they awake in the morning, they are wholly lost, not knowing in what direction is home. There's a couple of things here. They take them without them awakening. In the story I just read in the other book, the man awoke, the side of his house was gone and his wife was gone, but he never heard anything and he never awoke during that. Something happens to these people when the wild man comes and it's like very similar to UFOs having the ability to keep one person asleep in a bed and abducting the other. Think about that. When they woke in the morning, they were wholly lost, not knowing in what direction their home is. They say their track is about a foot and a half long. They frequently come in the night and steal their salmon from their nets and eat them raw. If the people are awake, they always know when they are coming very near by the smell which is most intolerable. So this is April 16th, 1840. Persistent reports have been and are still being circulated regarding the existence of a gigantic, hairy, man-like creature said to live in the mountains of the Pacific coast <clears throat> from Northern California up to British Columbia. Scores of pictures or plaster casts have been made by footprints that range in length from 18 to 24 inches, and hence the name of Bigfoot. This is what the writer put in here after the letter. The creature is also known by the Indian name Sasquatch. The Indian reports of this, quote, race of giants, as given by Walker, harmonize in many respects with recent accounts of sightings of the large footprints of their living in the snow-covered Cascade Mountains and their offensive odor. John Green, who has published the results of his extensive researches in the subject in the book and the track of Sasquatch. I told you about that last week. Although circumstantial evidence pointing to the actual existence of the Bigfoot is increasing, final confirmation of the reports, reports must wait for the discovery of a specimen. So, when we talk about a race of giants off a certain mountain, that they live in the snow, and they hunt and they do all their work at night and there are men stealers and they take the men and they're awake and they are asleep and they never awaken until the morning. Now why are these books important? Why do we study history? A race of giants. That's what the Indians called them at that time in that area. So, 
I'm interested in that part of the world that dealt with this years and years ago and how they documented that. Whether it was religious documentation, a priest or a father who came into that area, uh, a researcher, somebody from the community. This is important, folks. So, I got those books and I started reading. And I said, okay, they're not called animals. That's important. And the natives had a long, Native Americans had a long history of dealing with them. Hmm. So, let's go back to... I'm going to say, let's go back to this. I'm going to say it again. We're going to go back to this book I wrote. And I'm going to read you a few more stories in it. Because I want you to have the same benefit I had in how your brain developed on this topic. So the first one I'm going to read to you in this ongoing saga is 1886, November 25th. It's con the name of the article is The Wild Man of Ohio, and it was in uh, an Indiana, Pennsylvania newspaper. Party of hunters who have just returned from the hunt in the hills of Holmes County, Ohio, say they encountered a curious creature on their trip. According to their description, a wild man or some other strange being is at large in Holmes County. The party who reported seeing this strange creature claimed that he or it looked like a man, but actually acted like a wild beast. The creature was encountered near a brushy thicket and willow near what is known as Big Spring where General Buell rested on his march through Ohio at a point distance south of Wayne County line in Holmes County. The hunters were beating the bush for pheasants when they attracted the party to an object that suddenly darted across an opening in the brush. Later, the object was again seen along the edge of the brush, but this time the hunters had reached open ground and were surprised to see what they described as a man entirely nude, but covered with what appeared to them to be matted hair. What seemed was some distance away, but was discovering that the hunters, he started, he started towards them on a run and gave forth queer guttural, guttural sounds. On seeing the strange being moving towards them, the party of hunters, which included four persons all armed with shotguns, broke and ran. Think about that. All of them were armed with big shotguns and they were afraid enough to turn and run. The strange creature pursued them for a short distance until the party had reached a public highway when he turned back and was seen at Eater, seen to enter Kilbuck Creek, which he swam and disappeared into the brush again. On approaching the water, he dropped on all fours and plunged in like a dog swimming in a manner similar to a canine. The hunters did not have the nerve to return, but got away from the place as soon as possible. They are emphatic in their assertion that they encountered a wild man and described him as above, but they are of the impression that he was no relative of the famous wild man of Rockaway. Hmm. Next article, February 8th, 1889, Chicago. Georgia's Wild Man of the Woods, Chattanooga, Tennessee, February 7th, special edition. The citizens of Walker County, Georgia, a few miles from the city, Chattanooga, are much excited over the existence of a genuine wild man who haunts the mountain regions of the county. He is described as being gigantic stature, covered with a thick growth of hair, and carries a huge knotted stick. He has been seen by several parties, but all efforts to capture him have proved fruitless. The Interocean, Chicago, April 4th, 1891. Strange, hairy, 
gorilla-like creature found living in a cave. Columbus, Indiana, April 3rd. Years ago, a man named Barnes claimed to have discovered a wild man in a cave near Vernon, whom he described as a covered with a growth of hair, but he was ridiculed so much over his story that he would never disclose the location of the cave. Let's stop there for a second. There's a lot of people these days that say they are afraid of ridicule and they won't report the story. I find that peculiar. Here's why. Friends, in all of my time, over two years, talking to witnesses, taking their story, taking their photo with them signing a release, with them signing an affidavit to the sighting. Do you know how many people I met person to person, face to face, that said that they wouldn't sign an affidavit, that they wouldn't allow me to have their photo? None. So you hear about these podcasts and shows that say, oh, you know, we can't tell the person's name. Please, please be a critical thinker. I already know that people have left some of the biggest shows that you're talking about because the show host fabricated stories. If they don't give them a name and a location and a date, I give it zero credibility. I'm sorry. I just don't. Some of these people will throw a story at you and they know that there's a specific segment of the society that's just going to believe it. Okay, I'm, I'm back to this story. Recently, Alexander Shepard and a friend, they named the people, while scrolling in the hills in the vicinity, discovered the opening of a cave. And providing themselves with a lantern, they explored the interior until they found themselves confronted with a form resembling that of a gorilla or a wild man covered with a rough coat of brown hair. The strange creature looked at them for a second and then ambled off, and the gentlemen were too much alarmed to follow. While retracing their steps, the explorers found a storeroom partly filled with potatoes, corn, and wheat, with bones of fowl, etc., etc. Farmers in the vicinity have frequently complained of the loss of farm products, and it is believed a clue that had been found to their thief. Have you ever heard an animal do that? Have a storeroom of food? I haven't. Never. Baldwin, Michigan, October 21st, 1891. W.W. Vivian, both reputable citizens, reporting having seen a wild man over the banks of the Titabawisee River in Gladwin County. The man was nude, covered with hair, and was a giant in proportions. According to their story, he must have been at least seven feet high, his arms reaching below his knees and his hands twice the usual size. Mr. Vivian set his bulldog on the wild man, and with one mighty stroke, the monstrous hand, he felt the dog dead. His jumps were measured and found to be from 20 to 23 feet long. A couple of things about this. Here's a little clue for you. When you see a picture of somebody who's saying, oh, he has a picture of a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, I want you to stand up and look in the mirror. Hold your arms down to your waist and see how far down below your waist your hand falls. It's a pretty good barometer of how far a normal human arm is long. You look at Patty, the biped on the Patterson-Gimlin footage. You look at the Freeman footage. Those are all validated. Arms are much longer. That's how you can tell if it's a fraud or not. That's one way. When they said that it had super long arms, very good observation. The San Francisco, California newspaper, August 19th, 1894, found a wild man. The finder did not stop to secure his prize. Boise, Idaho is the dateline. A wild man has been found in Malhelm, Malhelm Creek in Oregon. For many days, past ranchers have heard strange noises among the willows and the wild wall of a human being blended with the lonesome yelps of coyotes. Yesterday, Lloyd Garrison was at work in Malhelm 
when the wild man suddenly made his appearance and frightened him horribly. He heard a series of yells, and then out of the brush came the figure of a man with a scanty rag about his loins. His eyes, wild and protruding from their sockets, and his emaciated body covered with short hair of dark color. Sounds like a pretty accurate description. And the sounds that are heard are pretty accurate of what are still heard today. April, uh, March April, uh, 1896, Wild Man Discovered makes his appearance near Johnson City. Appeared at the home of a mine boss and frightened the children entirely nude and covered with hair. Knoxville, Tennessee, March 21st. A special from Johnson City to the Tribune says, train men on the narrow gauge train arriving here about 12 o'clock today reported an excitement at Cranberry over the appearance of a wild man of the mountains yesterday evening. The first scene of this was a degenerate human specimen was late in the evening when he appeared at the residence of the mine boss, Phillips. He was absolutely nude and was covered with a shaggy coat of hair. The hair on the head and eyes and whiskers was very long and very gray. He entered one room with the Phillips home, which was occupied by three children. He came towards the fire running like a friendly hog and stretched out his hand as to keep warm. The children say that his fingernails were like great claws. The oldest one of the children is a boy 14 years old, and when he yelled at the hairy man to get out, he says that he groaned and left the room. The alarm was given and the other members of the family came on the scene just in time to see the man disappear in the woods. He leaped fences with the agility of a dog and moved with the speed of a deer. A party of men were at once organized and started in pursuit, but the wild man has probably made good his escape. It was intimated that it might have been a hallucination with the children, but barefooted tracks of a large size were seen leaving the house and followed in mud and patches of snow through which the man ran a considerable distance before his trail was finally lost. The citizens are very much excited and several parties armed to the teeth are hunting the woods in the hope that the strange man may be found. Strange man, strange man, man, wild man. Now before I go any further on this one, I talked to you last week about Harvey Pratt's drawing of the biped in the Patterson-Gimlin footage and he took the hair off. Let me explain something to you about the truthfulness of being an author. I spent two hours on the phone yesterday with Amazon because somebody told me, I don't watch this, I don't follow it, but somebody told me that there was an individual on Amazon selling one of my missing 411 books in Kindle form. Well, that's amazing because I've never made a Kindle version of the book and I own the copyright. So who's profiting from my copyright and from a Kindle version that they made and I didn't? It took me two hours to weave my way through Amazon and get to the right person who eventually said, Dave, I can't believe they did that to you. We will take it down. And they did. So thank you, Amazon. The point being, nobody respects work anymore. It's much easier to steal somebody else's and make a profit on it than do it yourself. Now, there were several comments about, well, Dave, why don't you show us the sketch that Harvey did? The reality of my world is I show you that sketch and it's a guarantee that people are going to take that sketch and they're going to put it in other books, they're going to put it in their videos, and I'll lose the copyright to the drawing. Right now, the copyright stands. It's in the book. So I really can't show you those things unless I'm willing to just give up my rights to everything. Now, I'm showing you a lot here, and I'm going to continue to show you, but to demand that everything I show you or I talk to you about be shown to you, that's a hard one. Your work is worth money, just like my work is worth money. If I work really hard for it, I'm willing to talk to you about it and give you the, the truth behind, hey, you take the, fa the hair off of the Patty face in the Patterson-Gimlin film, 
two independent people said it looked human. Doug Hycheck and everyone who's seen it in my books. I've never had anyone who's read my books say, oh yeah, it looked like an animal. Nobody, ever. It all looks human. So, being an author, half the time you're out, you're out there fending and blocking and trying to just maintain what you have because everyone's trying to steal from you. It's a weird world. It's not very ethical. Back to the book. June 14th, 1897, wild man seen again. He wears nothing but hair, which is long and curly. The wild man who created so much terror among the inhabitants near Rome, Ohio, several weeks ago by his strange actions, has again been seen. Charles Lukens and Bob Forner, again, named people, while cutting timber a few miles from Rome, claim they encountered a wild man and after a severe struggle, say they were able to drive the gorilla-like object into the supposed retreat among the cliffs. They describe the terror as being about six feet tall and is only covering apparently a mat of long curly hair. From their description of the supposed wild man, he is undoubtedly the same seen a number of times several weeks ago. Women and children are now more thoroughly frightened than ever and are afraid to venture from their homes lest they meet the wild creature. A posse of determined men will scour the country now until terror is located and captured or killed. And the last one, July 31st, 1901, wild man terrorizing community. He is gigantic in stature and runs about almost naked. The people of Borea, a suburb of Cleveland, are in terror over the frequent appearance of a wild man who chases children, women, and even men when he does not meet them in force. He is of great stature and runs about almost naked. He is agile as a deer and in the intervals of chasing human beings, climbs trees and chatters like a monkey. All efforts to capture him have proved unavailing, and the damage he has done so far has simply been to some people. A short article, but let me explain a few things about this. Early on when I was talking to elders about Bigfoot Sasquatch, they would say, Dave, you're going to hear a lot of stories about kids being chased, uh, people being chased. And they said, when you hear those stories, it probably happened. But don't think that the Bigfoot was trying to capture them, because that's not, not what's happening. They're just trying to play. And the elders would say, we think sometimes they understand that they don't look like us and they scare us. So they try to play and make friends. In one of my books, there was a story that a family lived on the side of a hill and one of their young boys was riding a motorcycle up to the top of their house and then would turn around and ride it all the way down, then ride it back up. And their mom wasn't paying much attention. She could just hear and knew the boy was out there. And as long as the engine was going, everything was okay. When I met with the mom, she said, Dave, if I hadn't seen it, I never would have believed anybody telling me. And she said that at one point, she didn't know why, she walked out on the deck and her son was turning around at the top and started to go back down. And out of the side brush came this Bigfoot. And she said, at first I thought it was a bear. But it didn't run like a bear. It ran like a human on two feet. And it ran all the way down the mountain. Then it ran back into the bush. Then my son would turn around and it would get behind the motorcycle and it would run back up and then run back in the woods. And she said, when my son finally got back up, I yelled at him to stop. And I told him he had to come in because it scared me. 
She said it looked like it was an adolescent Bigfoot because it wasn't very big, but it was probably just trying to have fun. And there are a lot of those stories out there. Another one. This was in Minnesota. I sent Harvey out to Minnesota to interview some people to do some sketches at one point. Ben was in a uh, hockey camp in northern Minnesota. And uh, during their dry land training, and when they weren't on the ice, I went out and did my own thing and I had some people tell me about some sightings up in northern Minnesota. I went up there, introduced myself, and I just started talking. And one of the most interesting ones came from a group of ladies that lived in a house backed up against this giant swamp. And they said that over the years they'd had They'd seen Bigfoot walk through their yard. They were, they were native people. And they said the strangest one was this large Bigfoot came into their yard. And they said it might have been an older teenager, but it might have been an adult too. And it sat under the clothesline that ran across their yard from their house to the far back of the yard. So it came up and it sat down right under the clothesline. And she said that the clothesline was about six feet up off the ground. And she said when this thing sat down, its head was almost even with the clothesline. And it had one of the clothespins, one of the old wooden ones, on the line in front. And what it was doing was flicking the clothespin and having it spin around on the, on the rope. She said, I couldn't believe what I was saying. <laughs> she said, there's no way I am watching this. And she said, it had a face like a human, hair all over the body. It was sitting on the ground and it sat there and it spun this probably 50 times. She goes, maybe even more. But it just was entranced by this thing spinning around. She said eventually it got up and was way higher than the clothesline, she said, and it walked back into the swamp area. Now this woman, again, native, and all the native people I've met, they have a respect for the biped. I never met one Native American or Native Canadian, and I have met hundreds, never one that said it was an animal. Yet you watch your shows on TV and the disrespect they show for that opinion, reprehensible. Okay, I'm going to talk to you now about John Green. John lived in British Columbia and did some phenomenal work on researching Bigfoot Sasquatch in the 50s and early 60s. And there were two people that he wrote about, William Rowe and Albert Osman. And William Rowe, I'm just gonna read you a short part of this and then I'm gonna discuss it with you. He said he had been working on the highway near Tet John Cash T-E-T-E-J-A-U-N-E Cash C-A-C-H-E for about two years. In October 1955, I decided to climb five miles up Mica, M-I-C-A mountain to an old deserted mine just for something to do. I came inside of the mine about three o'clock in the afternoon after an easy climb. I'd just come out of a patch of low brush into a clearing when I saw what I thought was a grizzly bear in the brush on the other side. I'd shot a grizzly near that spot the year before this was only about 75 yards away, but I did not want to shoot it, for I had no way of getting it out. So I sat down on a small rock and watched, my rifle in my hands. I could, see the th I could just see the top of the animal's head and the top of one shoulder. A moment later, it raised up and stepped out into the opening, and then I saw that it was not a bear. This is, to the best of my recollection, is what the creature looked like and how it acted as it came across the clearing directly towards me. 
my impression was of a huge man, about six feet tall, three feet wide, and probably weighing near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot with dark brown, silver-tipped hair, but as it came closer, I saw by its breasts that it was a female. 1955. He said it looked like a human. Remember this, folks. These are untainted observations. A huge man covered with hair. Its torso was not curved like a female's. Its broad frame was straight from shoulder to hip. Its arms were much thicker than a man's arms and longer, reaching almost to its knees. Remember what I just told you about sightings and distances of arms, length of arms? Pay attention to that. When it walked, it placed the heel of its foot down first, and I could see the gray-brown skin or height of the soles of its feet. If you watch the Patterson-Gimlin film in its stabilized version, you will see the heel goes down and then the rest of the foot in a very pronounced manner, just like William Rose said. I came to the edge of the bush it was hiding in within 20 feet of me and squatted down on its haunches, reaching out with its hands and pulled the branches of the brushes toward it and stripped the leaves with its teeth, its lips curled flexibly around as it ate. I was close enough to see that its teeth were white and even. The shape of the creature's head somewhat resembled a negro's. The head was higher in the back than in the front. The nose was broad and flat. The lips and chin protruded further than its nose, but the hair that covered it, leaving bare only the parts of the face around the mouth, nose, and ears, made it resemble an animal as much as a human. None of its hair, even on the back of the head, was longer than an inch, and that its face was much shorter. Its eyes were small and black like a bear's, and its neck was unhuman, thicker and shorter than any man I'd ever seen. I'm going to skip a bunch because I don't want to bore you. Finally, the, the wild thing must have got my scent for it looked directly at me through an opening in the bush. I'm going to stop there for a second. I cannot tell you the, the number of times witnesses say they're watching these things. They make no sound and suddenly it looks directly at you. It's almost like they had a sixth sense that you were there and boom. A look of amazement crossed its face. It looked so comical at the moment I had to grin. Still in a crouched position, it backed up three or four steps, then straightened up to its full height and started to walk rapidly back the way it had came. For a moment, it watched me over its shoulder as it went, not exactly afraid, but as though it wanted no contact with anything strange. The thought came to me that if I shot it, I would poss possibly have a specimen of great interest to science in the world over. I had heard stories about Sasquatch, the giant hairy Indians that live in the legends of British Columbia Indians, and also many claim are still in fact alive today. Maybe this was a Sasquatch, I told myself. I leveled my rifle, the creature was still walking rapidly again, turning its head to look in my direction. I lowered the rifle, although I have called the creature it, I felt now that it was a human being and I knew I would never forgive myself if I killed it. How many times do I have to read these stories to you before it starts to click in with some people that this is not a stupid animal? Friend, this is, friends, this is a very profound moment. And I want you to understand that it took me a long time to get my thoughts aligned. But even at this early stage where I am with you, I'm going, why are these people who are big time researchers in the Bigfoot world claiming this is an animal or a gorilla or an ape? Why are they claiming that? Because I'm doing the homework and the background and the history and I ain't seeing it. 
So that was William Rowe. Now what John Green did is he took an affidavit from William Rowe. And he took an affidavit swearing under penalty of perjury that what they were saying was true and accurate. Well, Albert Osman had to do the same thing with John Green. Why did Green do that? Number one reason, he wanted to make sure that his story was accurate so that the witnesses would have to read it and sign it and say it was true. So nobody could take the story later and twist it to make it align with their thoughts. Now, why is that important, friends? Because there's several sites out there, some of them very big, that have a habit of doing just that. An investigator goes out to the field, turn the report into the front office, and all of a sudden, the report doesn't match what the investigator took in the field. And you, as a witness, never know that. There are certain sites that won't ever report anything unusual, paranormal, supernatural. They won't do it. Even though the witness says it, they won't do it. So how can you, as a witness, no, you as an interested party, develop thoughts and ideas about what is really happening here. Well, if you trust online sources, you're screwed because it's not true. And that's, to me, very disheartening because I believed a couple of these sites when I was young and I and then when I started to hear the supernatural or the very unusual, or I would just say, oh, those people are crazy. That didn't happen because it wasn't on this site. But then when times when I eventually met the witnesses, and they said, no, that's, that's not what I wrote. That's not what I said. It was changed. And then when I got a hold of the investigator, they said, yeah, it was changed when we turned it in. We can't do anything. If we make a big stink about it, we'll get kicked out of the organization. And we want to stay in the organization because we want to read the reports. I've heard that a hundred times. So be aware. Now, Albert Osman. Albert was a prospector. And he was in an area called Toba Inlet. So here's Vancouver, and here's Toba Inlet, and here's Campbell River. Now, if you're a regular watcher of my missing persons videos, just in the last six months, I have talked to you about a series of disappearances right in this area where people were never found. Isn't that amazing? So, I'm not saying anything, I'm just, I can't ignore facts. So Albert was sleeping in the middle of nowhere. Look up Toba Inlet on Google or Yahoo, and then look at the images. You'll get blown away how beautiful it is. Really beautiful. So anyhow, he's back there prospecting and he's camped in the middle of nowhere and one night somebody, something comes into camp. And based on what was done in his camp, he knew it wasn't a regular animal and it wasn't a bear. And he thought, hmm, but it was doing peculiar things. So what he, de what he decided to do was in his sleeping arrangement, he took his shoes off but kept them with him <clears throat> and kept his rifle and slept with his rifle. Well, in the middle of the night, something comes in, picks up his blanket and everything, throws it over its shoulder and starts walking with him. And he described hours 
being carried like this by something he had no idea what it was. And eventually, he gets dropped in a cave. And when he wakes, wakes up, there's a family of Bigfoot there. A wife, a husband, that's what he described it as, and a boy and a girl. And he said that he didn't quite know why he was there. It was strange. But it, it was in this cave setting. And a couple things about the story that really made sense to me. One of the things that were written is that I could, this is in Osman's words, I could now make out mountains all around me. I looked at my watch, it was 4.25 a.m. I was getting lighter now and I could see the people clearly. They looked like a family, old man, old lady, and two young ones, a boy and a girl. The boy and girl seemed to be scared of me. The old lady did not seem too pleased about what the old man dragged home, but the old man was waving his arms and telling them all what he had in mind. They all left me then. I had my compass and my prospecting glass on strings around my neck. The compass in my left hand shirt pocket and my glass in my right hand. I tried to reason our location of where I was. I could see now that I was in a small valley or basin about 8 or 10 acres surrounded by high mountains. On the southeast side there was a V-shaped opening about 8 feet wide at the bottom and about 20 feet wide at the highest point. But how will I get out? That's what he wondered. I moved my belongings up close to the west wall. There were two small cypress trees there. Moving on, I got a drink and a full can of water. When I got back, the young boy was looking over my belongings, but did not touch anything. On the way back, I noticed that these people were sleeping. On the east wall of the valley was a shelf high on the mountain with overhanging rock looking something like a big undercut in a big tree about 10 foot deep and 30 feet wide. The floor was covered with lots of dry moss and they had some kind of blankets woven with narrow strips of cedar bark packed with dry moss. They looked very practical and warm with no need of washing. That is not made by animals, friends. That takes some skill, and this is important. Skipping forward, the following day I did not see the old lady until about 4 p.m. She came home with her arms full of grass and twigs of all kinds, from spruce and hemlock as well as some kind of nuts that grow in the ground. I've seen lots of them on Vancouver Island. The young fellow went up to the mountain to the east every day. He could climb better than a mountain goat. He picked some kind of grass with long roots. He gave me some one day. They tasted very sweet. I gave him another snuff box with about the size of a teaspoon in it. He tasted it and then went to the old man, he licked it with his tongue. They had a long chat. I made a dipper with some milk and shared. The young fellow might have been between 11 and 18 years old, about seven feet tall, might weigh about 300 pounds. His chest would be about 50 to 55 inches, his waist 36 to 38 inches. He had wide jaws, narrow forehead, and the slanted forward round the back of the four or five inches higher than the forehead. The hair on the head was about six inches long. The hair on the rest of the body was short and thick in places. The woman's hair was a bit longer. Skipping ahead, if the old man were to wear a collar, it would have been at least 30 inches in length. I have no idea what size shoes they would need. I was watching the younger fellow's foot one day when he was sitting down. The soles of his feet seemed to be padded like a dog's foot and the big toes were longer than the rest and were very strong. In mountain climbing, all he needed was footing with the big toe. They were very agile. To sit down, they turned their knee out and came straight down. To rise, they came straight up without the help of their hands or arms. I don't think this valley was their permanent home. I think they moved from place to place as food is available. They might eat meat, but I never saw them eat meat or do any cooking. This was Albert Osman. Now, he, he ended up escaping by blowing some snuff 
that he had and having uh, the father figure use some snuff and be debilitated at a time and then he, he was able to escape I gotta say that reading his affidavit and as John Green said that there were things he said in there that years later came to be true that's not an easy thing to do unless you experience it now his story's been picked apart well you know when he told the story he said he had a sleeping bag but there were no sleeping bags and yeah so what so what For the ease of the conversation, I probably would have said the same thing. I was sleeping in a bag, and whatever. Trying to pick somebody's story apart like that when he had specifics about it that nobody else could have known, key points. The pads on the feet were exactly as though Patty in the Patterson-Gimlin film. The size of the two's toes have been exhibited in many casts along the way. So as I'm doing this research into people, I got a copy of something called the track record. It was sent to me by someone. And what it was, it was a newsletter written out of Oregon by a man named Ray Crow. The uh, newsletter was probably 15 pages long, well written, and mostly dealt with Bigfoot UFO, sometimes other things. It always had really good photos and it had witnesses' names. They had meetings regularly in Oregon with Ray at the helm. And Ray had done this work for years, accumulating stories, etc. There were 174 newsletters that he wrote between 1991 and 2007. In total, 3,000 pages. Thousands of sighting reports, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Wildman, UFO reports, some stories about the Loch Ness Monster, Chupacabra, researcher reports, Yeti, Yowie, Yaren reports, photos from researchers that you probably don't know but were very credible and Bigfoot photos and sketches. This is what I wrote about Ray. The track record was written by Ray Crow of Hillsboro, Oregon. Ray collected sighting reports and fascinating articles from throughout the world via his web of contacts. The newsletters totaled 174 over 3,000 pages and were much too bulky to print and distribute. I was getting into the Bigfoot world. I read a bunch of Ray's newsletters. And then I read that Ray was retiring because of health concerns. He was, he was a diabetic. And he was selling all of his research, trying to find a way to retire. Well, I didn't care about really anything other than those newsletters because I saw extreme value in those. So I drove up to Hillsboro. I met Ray, one of the nicest men you could ever meet. He was in a wheelchair. I think by that time he had lost one of his legs to diabetes. We had a great talk. I bought his research. Boxes and boxes. I, I took a U-Haul and I flew up to Portland, rented a U-Haul, drove over to his house, spent the whole day, loaded the U-Haul and drove back to Los Gatos. One of the best purchases I ever made in my life. I got the biggest education in my life from Ray Crow and the researchers that contributed to the track record. That was the name of his newsletter, the track record. So going on, North America Bigfoot Search, my organization, purchased the rights to Mr. Crow's research in 2007 and immediately took on the task of developing an index for the entire track record collection. The track records and index 
80 page index represents a single greatest research tool for Bigfoot Sasquatch researchers ever produced. The great work of Mr. Crow coupled with the index produced by NABS make this CD a very unique and valuable tool to everyone casually interested in or researching Bigfoot PC and Mac compatible. And there it is. I spent months doing this work. And it's when I still had custody of my kids. So when they were at school, I was scanning the newsletters and doing the index simultaneously. This is available on our website. What I learned was stunning, <coughs> uh, to say the least. Remember, I was reading these older books, reading accounts from researchers, explorers. I keep hearing this wild man, human. Well, in Ray's newsletter, people had gone out and gotten hair samples, etc., and gotten them DNA tested. And guess what? Folks, every entry in his newsletter about Bigfoot Sasquatch DNA, every entry came back human. Huh. Well, the other side of the fence came back and just attacked him. Well, those are all contaminated. That's why they came back human. Every one contaminated, huh? That's a cheap, cheap ploy to try to put down the other side. They had no evidence it was contaminated. They had none. And remember, you are now armed with valuable information about how we're going to continue to walk this path. Now, admittedly, the months I spent reading, researching, and contacting people associated with the track record, I was well on my way to having an opinion for sure. Because the people I contacted that were associated with Ray were some of the nicest, most wholesome people that had no dog in the fight. We're just telling the truth. We're trying to find what they were dealing with, just like me. But as I walked further down the path, it got harder for me to understand how this opinion got so divergent so quickly, I didn't understand it. I still don't understand it. But, so today, we talked about more articles. This is on my website, nabigfootsearch.com. NA, like North America, bigfootsearch.com. And you can read about the DNA study there. I talk to you about the stories in this book. The Diary of Elkanah Walker, 1838 to 19 to 1848. And then I also talk to you about the Nahalem Tillamook Tales, Native American book. Important stuff. And lastly, I read you a little bit out of John Green's book about Osman and Roe and how he took affidavits from witnesses and that is exactly why in the Hoopa Project and in Tribal Bigfoot I took affidavits from all of my witnesses. They had to sign under penalty of perjury that what they were saying was true. Now, why is that important, friends? Because I want to make sure that what I'm going to write is exactly what they saw and they are swearing to it. Why doesn't any Bigfoot organization in North America take affidavits like I did? 
or like we did, or like John Green did? Is it because it gives them the latitude to change the story? Is it because it's too much effort? Whatever the reason, I don't like it. Because it's just another hoop in accuracy and truthfulness. And then lastly, I talked about the track record. The single greatest piece of information at 3,000 pages on a CD now I ever found. When I was done with the track record, I thought, wow, other people need to read this. But I couldn't, in my mind, I'm thinking, how many binders would this fill? How, how much would it cost to mail? And then finally I thought, oh, that's stupid. They put it on a CD. Just scan it all. And I had people help me scan all these pages and put it on a CD. And it's on a thumb drive. Yeah. I got, a, I got a lot of epiphanies out of that book. There's a lot of things in it that will stun you. So friends, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to my channel. I would appreciate it. And then the movie right here, you can watch the trailer for it. It comes out December 12th. And I have two other documentaries that are gonna be listed under the pinned number one comment. You can watch them for free. Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted. Please, please share this on your social media site. Let others understand the path that we're walking on. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it narrow. We're just going to keep walking down the line talking about things. And I'll bring in other sources to explain to you how and why the truth maybe isn't out there. So, thanks. My website for Bigfoot, NA, like North America, BigfootSearch.com, our online stores there. Missing people, CanAmMissing.com, Canadian American, like CanAmMissing.com. And uh, be safe. Do something nice for somebody today. As you're walking down the street, you see somebody that needs a door open, you see an elderly person having a tough time getting things in their car, do something nice for them. We need more things in this world where we're being nice to each other. And I'll see you next week. Politis out. <laughs>